Um, uh, tonight we'll be uh, doing the uh, Eighth Commandment. And I thought, oops, did I go too far? No, I didn't. Good. I thought we could start with Psalm uh, 51, which is a beautiful prayer for pardon uh, from King David. Uh, remember after he had sinned with Bathsheba, um, Prophet Nathan came in and called him out, and he realized he had sinned. So this was the prayer that he prayed. You guys can sit right here in the front right, because these people are not coming tonight. So let's pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your merciful love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you, your, you desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Cle create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guilt, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you take no delight in sacrifice. Were I to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God. You will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings. The, then bulls will be offered on your altar. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, uh, as... Oh, no, not this again. We're just like going to slowly go through them. It's okay. I'm just going to be... So, uh, as a sum up for uh, last week's race through the commandments, uh, I said that if you could have a whole course on Catholic bioethics. And this is a lovely uh, self-paced course put on by the Institute of Catholic Culture, an organization that I just uh, couldn't recommend more fervently, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. And then if you go to, you have to like sign in. I haven't signed in here, but you can still see it without signing in. But when you sign in, you have a little account and then you can take the courses. And this is the course called Catholic Bioethics. And you can see they co cover topics like uh, techni technological reproduction, abortion, contraception, sterilization, uh, what to do for different uh, things like bodily integrity, privacy, sexual intimacy, stem cell research, cloning, all the things that we don't have time to go into all the, in depth. Uh, Father um, does a great job of going into greater details uh, in this course. So Catholic bioethics for those who wanted to have more depth study. And then I said also um, for those who want more depth study on Catholic politics. Um, another, uh, there's actually, this is actually a two semester course, so they have Catholic Political Thought 101, and then you could take Catholic Political Thought 102. Um, but again, uh, just there's plenty of opportunities for us to learn more about uh, what the church teaches regarding so many of our just basic things that we need to know just to live life. And so I'd encourage you, like, you know, you're, you've been studying every Monday for this year, and you'll be like, okay, now I know everything. No, you don't. You don't even know nearly anything. You just know, you've just broken into the surface of, like, realizing there's a lot more to know. And here's a great place where you can say, let's go a little bit deeper and all the different things that interest me. So Catholic political thought for those who want to uh, take that course. And, again, the, the wonderful thing about these is they're all self-paced. So the lectures are already there. The readings are already there. Everything's there. You just go, and you, if you want to take one course 
uh, a week, you can. And if you're on vacation or you're on work, you just skip that week. And if you're like, I can do two a week, boom, you go two a week, however fast or slow you want. So um, <clears throat> tonight, we want to try to cover the Eighth Commandment uh, and then go upstairs for a little bit of a tour of the church. Next week, we'll be covering the last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. That will also include uh, purgatory, uh, which is uh, a lovely concept for us to consider. So that would be like the, going back to that first part of the creed when we were walking through the, excuse me, the first part of the catechism where we, we were walking through the creed, we kind of skipped the last part where it's, I believe, in the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. That's that part of the creed. Uh, so back to CCC paragraph 988. Uh, so death, judgment, heaven, and hell next week. Um, but this week, the Eighth Commandment. And we want to kind of situate the Eighth Commandment, as we said, all the commandments, we can situate them as commandments of love, not just thou shalt not kill, but thou shalt honor life, not just thou shalt not commit adultery, but thou shalt honor the gift of sexuality, not just thou shalt not steal, but thou shalt honor uh, property, not just thou shalt not or thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, but thou uh, shalt honor uh, truth. And so we can think, for example, uh, in John's gospel, the beautiful line, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Or you can remember our Lord speaking um, and saying, I am the way and the truth and the life. So part of your job seen in the front corner is to take one past the others down. Um, and so we uh, could begin with the idea of truth, and we'd want to kind of say that first and foremost, then our God is truth. And so our uh, commitment to truth is going to then stem from our, voc our vocation to bear witness to God's truth. We can say that uh, um, God himself has said, I am the way and the truth, that he is truth. You can think at the beginning of John's gospel, it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And our translation of word uh, in John's gospel is a little bit of a difficult um, way to translate because you're like word, like, like which word, <laughs> but, and it's not like, and so we just kind of, kind of think, I don't know what that means. And we just move on in John's gospel. Let's not worry about things that are confusing. But, uh, if we were to kind of read it in the Greek, we'd say that the word there is, is logos. In the beginning was, was logos. And like, what is logos? Well, logos can mean word, but it can also mean reasonable. It can mean, uh, a little bit more of a, uh, of a richness than just maybe in the English word, word. And so as we kind of recognize that our Lord is, is, is that organizing principle, he's, he's truth itself, uh, that then our, when he says, you will be my witnesses, we're thinking, then we need to bear witness to the truth. And we see then how completely contrary to the idea of being a Christian, the idea of bearing false witness becomes if we're denying uh, um, the God. And so we have this beautiful line from the first Vatican Council saying, uh, therefore, any understanding of the truth is an under, any undermining of the truth is an undermining of God's covenantal relationship with man and is an offense against the holiness of God, who can neither deceive nor be deceived. And so since our Lord is the fullness of truth, then we want to obviously speak words that allow us to be re remain united to our Lord. Where's my arrow? Sorry, there it is. And so, um, key little thought here at the bottom, because truth is a person. If our truth has been revealed as a person, then we can think anytime I'm speaking the truth, and that, you know, that the... Um, I don't know, that a triangle has three sides, and you can think, what is, what, what is the truths of math and the truths of geometry have to do with God? Like, well, God is the source and origin of all that is. When we speak the truth, we speak of God. So, um, we also can say, so what is truth? Well, truth is, a, there's different definitions from philosophy, but the one I like right here is the truth is a statement that corresponds to reality. So, truth is the correspondence to reality, like what is real and then what we say, that the two are correspondence, that they're, they're the same. And so speaking the truth then means uh, being in conformity, uh, speaking what is in conformity with the mind. Like what is in my mind is what I convey, whether that's using words, 
when we say speaking, but also we know we speak with our body language. So we also, you know, we want to include more than just what your tongue is doing, but also like what is your face doing? All of this is a way that we speak the truth. Welcome. We're glad you made it. And so um, all of this uh, to kind of convey to the recipient of my truth. Uh, and then we can think that this, this speaking of truth is just fundamental to, to a society. We really can't have a relationship with each other if there's not this rootedness in truthfulness. And so um, we, uh, truth is that virtue uh, which consists in showing oneself true in deeds and truthful in words and guarding against duplicity, dissimulation, and hypocrisy. That's the Catechism 2468. And so we are called to bear witness uh, to the truth. That is, in the life of the Christian, we're called to speak the truth without equivocation after the example of St. Paul's. Clearly, in regards to the truths of the faith, of what do we believe in Jesus, but then it, by extension, anytime we're speaking, since we said Jesus is truth itself, anytime we're speaking, when we want to speak the truth, even to the point of when we say martyrdom is the supreme witness to the truth, martyrdom means to bear witness. A martyr is a witness. But we think of martyrdom as those who shed their blood because they refuse to renounce the truth. So typically, like some of the saints that you all have chosen for your confirmation saints, you've chosen a saint who maybe we say it was a martyr, that it was basically, do you deny Jesus? Are you willing to speak a lie and say, I am not on team Jesus? And they say, no, I'm not willing to speak that lie. I would rather die. I'd rather be a witness to the truth than lie. And so that's where so many of your saints who died martyrs, we think, gave the supreme witness. They said, no, I will not ever speak a lie and say, I don't know Christ. I do not love him. I am not one of his. And so an important point here at the bottom, that people have a natural right to life and an obligation to defend their life, right? We talked about that. But the calling to bear witness to the truth is even higher than that. And that's why we would even want to say, I have an obligation to defend my life. But, you know, the, in the wane of obligations, speaking the truth is even higher than that because speaking of the, tr the truth is bearing witness to God, who is an even higher good. Obviously, God is a higher good. Life is a good. My life is pretty good, but I don't think anybody here thinks that their life is bigger than God. So the, in the like, ranking of goods, God is going to outrank my life. So offenses against truth. There's tons of them. Um, some of them are on your handout that I, I gave you there. Um, false witness, right, uh, which one done under oath. This is like the, what the work commandment actually says, thou shalt not bear false witness. It could be the sin of perjury, right? Um, especially a mortal sin if you're harming somebody, right? You can think like you bear witness in court. Oh, yes, that's the guy. I saw him kill him. So he gets the death penalty because of your perjury. Oh, my goodness, you're... You've, you've done a horrible, horrible thing. Obviously, that would be a mortal sin, but you could still be a mortal sin if it's causing grave harm to an innocent person, right? Your, your testimony puts the other person in jail. Your testimony fines the other person exorbitantly, right? You can think how, obviously, this would be a sin of mortal proportion, right? Rash judgment uh, is a sin against the truth because instead of allowing yourself to come to know the truth, you stop your intellect from receiving knowledge and you just say, nope, I already know what I think is the truth when maybe you don't, right? So rash judgment is when we accept something that's true without sufficient foundation. Detraction uh, would it be when you disclose another faults, another's faults and failings, even though it's true, but you're speaking about them in a way that nobody deserves to know. Such an important kind of concept here. Sometimes you'll say like, but I didn't say anything that wasn't true. But you shouldn't have said it at all. And so you've still sinned against truthfulness. There's some things that you shouldn't have said. Or you can think calumny that when you've damaged another's reputation by false statements. That one everyone's agree, usually in agreement. Like, yeah, that would be, that would be a sin. You know? So either one of these, detraction or calumny, sometimes we call it gossip. You know, when you're talking about other people. But don't pretend like just because it's true, it's okay to do it. Like, you know, the person has a right to a good reputation, and you basically just slaughtered their reputation. You know, you, not very good of you. Um, and we had said um, other sins like uh, flattery, uh, when you're uh, 
basically tell this other person how good they are when maybe they're not. And they, maybe they could have needed you to have called them out, right? You know, and especially you could think like how obvious, like if you're like, you can think, you know, Ben on his gun range, if he's just like, oh yeah, you're the greatest shooter ever. You know, like this flattery that then causes the soldier to go and get himself killed because, you know, Ben flattered him and said, no, you don't need to practice, you're good. So you could easily see how this could be a horrible thing to do. But it, in general, in life, we want to avoid this. But also the br ba br boasting or bragging, the sin against truth, as we uh, uh, can uh, cause so much harm. Some people may be shocked when I would speak also of sarcasm as a sin against truth. Yeah. I know, we can love it so much, uh, but when you think of the Greek sarcasm, it means eating the flesh. Your sarcastic humor, that's sarks is, is flesh. Like your sarcastic humor is the eating of the flesh. And so whose flesh are you eating? Often the sarcastic comment is against your neighbor, right? You're making fun of them. You're eating their flesh. How mean of you. Or you're like, well, I do it against myself. I eat my own flesh. Not cool. Don't be a cannibal. Don't be a cannibal in your words either then. So if you have to work on repenting, you can repent. Um, so do, 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 do. the lying is the, like the big one, though, that I want to talk about because so many people like thought. I remember I talked about the lying and the truth uh, with my high school kids when I was a brand new priest. There I was, and I'm talking to high school kids, and the one kid instantly, he's like, but father, everybody lies. As in, it can't be a sin if everybody's doing it. Well, allow me to tell you that in the Christian tradition, lying is always a sin. Even if everybody is doing it, lying is always a sin. St. Thomas Aquinas defines lying as a statement that is at variance with the mind. When you intend to say what is false. So you can think that there'd be a couple of times when you might say something that is false that's not a lie just because you're wrong. That wouldn't be, you're not, you haven't lied if you're wrong. You didn't say what, what was in your mind, you said. Now what was in your mind was wrong, so you had the material for a lie, but there was no form, there was no willfulness. You didn't say, you didn't say what you knew to be false, you thought it was true. So not a lie if you are just wrong. So never be afraid to, like, when I ask you a question, to answer it and be, I like that's wrong. You haven't lied. No sin there. Or on your test in two weeks, you write down something and you're wrong. It's not like you're guilty now of having sinned by lying. No, you just wrote down something that was false. But when I intend to say something false, mm, now I have lied. And you can think our Lord is so um, damning with his condemnation of lying. He says, that Satan was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And so when we speak lies, rather than claiming God as our father, who is truth itself, we are claiming Satan as our father, and we become like sons of Satan. And if you uh, can't allow our Lord's words to convict you, saying, I got to start being a man of truthfulness, then I have nothing for you. But certainly to respond to my high school friend, then we all have a lot of repenting to do. If everybody's lying, then everybody should get in the confession line and repent because we need to break that bad habit. So the gravity of a lie can depend on several things. Oops, went too far. The nature of the truth that's deformed. What am, what am I lying about, right? Am I lying about something huge, like there is one God? Or I, I'm saying, no, there's actually seven gods? Okay, that would be a huge lie because of the nature of the truth I'm breaking. Or, or maybe I'm lying about something smaller. You know, um, how much money do you have? And I say, I've got 35 cents in my pocket. I actually... I know I've got a dollar fifty, and I just don't want to give you the dollar, so I just tell you I've got the cents, and I'd lie about. I could have given you a dollar. I just lied. You know, much smaller t to lie about a dollar. <clears throat> the circumstances, what's going on, the intention of my lie. Am I lying to uh, make you feel good? Am I lying because I'm going to get some something covered? by my lie. So all these things kind of can weigh in of whether it's going to be a mortal sin or whether it's going to simply be a venial sin. But it's always going to be 
sin. A sin. Absolutely. So it's just a question of how bad it is. It's not a question of uh, um, is it bad or not. So we can say like, you know, these heart hurtful lies are going to be the worst, the ones that I'm trying to hurt you, like, you know, so that I can, you know, get, be things good. The, these, we sometimes call them white lies where I'm trying to save you from being hurt or I'm trying to make you feel good. You know, they're probably maybe not going to be as serious, but they could still be wrong. It's still a venial sin. You know, you, you know, you think the classic one, you know, when your wife asks you, do I look fat? You're like, you know, you're still sinning by lying to her. She doesn't want you to lie. And if she does, then shame on her for wanting you to commit sin. But it's probably not as serious a wrong lie as when you try to hurt her with the truth or hurt your neighbor, some other neighbor with the truth. Versus, we call them the jocose lies, and that's like what St. Thomas Aquinas calls them. That's the lie, and he says it's not really even a lie if it's simply meant to be funny and everybody knows that it's funny. You know, like you can think, for example, you know, when, um, you know, in a play, somebody stands up and says, like, I am George Washington, and everybody laughs. Like, you know, nobody thinks that the guy's actually claiming to be George Washington. You know, this is not even a lie, even though... The, it's speaking something that's true. Same time, it's like, yeah, but in the mind, you're not even trying to convey what's in your mind at that point. You're just trying to read what's, you know, your play your role. It's, 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 and so he says, rather than even calling this a lie, he says, really, it isn't even a lie. Now, there could be times when it, a joke is a lie. You know, you, maybe you, uh, you know, knock on the door of somebody's house. And you, you say, you know, maybe as you were coming in, you saw they had a fancy car, right? Maybe nice little uh, uh you know, red uh, convertible, and so you knock on the door of their house, and you're like, anybody know whose red convertible that is? Because it just got hit by a deer, and everyone's like, oh, that's my red convertible. And you're like, just joking. You know, like, it was, you know, that might have been a lie. Maybe it was sinful, you know, especially you think you'd feel really bad if the guy, like, grabbed his heart and had a heart attack and died right there. You'd feel pretty bad, wouldn't you? You're like, oh, it wasn't funny, was it? But you meant it to be funny. So, so, we, so sometimes the jocose lie could be not just uh, funny, but it could be a sin, right? So to be careful. Um, so we can say here, since it violates the virtue of truthfulness, a lie does real violence to another. You know, sometimes you can think we tell our children, uh, sticks and stones can break your bones, but words can never hurt me. But let's be real here. How many of us remember some of the worst things that people said to us? I think every one of us is going to raise our hands. Words hurt us very badly, don't they? They can hurt much worse than the stick or the stone sometimes. I don't necessarily remember the pain from some of the beatings I took from some of my friends on the playground, but I might still remember the taunting words that they said. And so to think that you know words are so very important. You know, when we think that it is through words that God created all of the universe, then God said, and it was, and God said, and it was, and God said, and it was. When we think that so many of the sacraments are conveyed to us through the power of words, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. This is my body. When we think about how powerful words are, we might pause before we make light of the gift of human speech, which I know in today's society, we're like, words are cheap, but maybe they shouldn't be, right? Maybe they shouldn't be because words are really actually really powerful. You know, just a total aside, but I saw there was a study that was done where they took two plants, and the one plant, somebody just yelled at the plant and cursed the plant and told it how stupid it was and how ugly a plant it was. And another plant, the person would just talk to the plant, tell the plant how wonderful it was, how green it was, how lovely a plant it was. And over the course of time, this, the, the cursed plant shriveled up and died. And the complimented plant grew nice and bushy. They watered them the same. They gave them the same amount of light. Everything was the same except for the power of words. Let's not pretend that words are cheap. Let's not let our words be cheap. So as it says here, every offense against truth carries with it the duty to make reparation. 
And so we want to think if you have sinned through your speech, you want to apologize. If you've gossiped about somebody, you want to try to restore their reputation. If you've sinned with your speech, you want to make reparation. You want to try to repair the damage. Is it ever permissible to lie? So we said lying is always wrong. It's just whether is it a mortal or venial sin. As St. Thomas says, it's evident that the greater the good intended, the more the sin of lying, though, is diminished in its gravity. So you can think like the classic example of, you know, the, the everybody likes to say is like, you know, you're at your door and you've, you're hiding, you know, the Jews in your house and the Nazi soldiers show up and they ask you, are there any Jews in your house? And you, what do I do? What do I do? And you can say like, well, I'm trying to protect their life. And so I lie and I say no there's no Jews in my house you know like you know and you, and you realize that you've lied and you know obviously it's still wrong but the good that you're intending is going to make it less wrong but it's still wrong it is still wrong remember when we said object intention and circumstances no circumstances can ever make the object that's evil all of a sudden a good thing to do it never becomes a good thing to do but we can maybe understand why you did it. But it's not the right thing to do. They're not the right thing to do. Now, there are times when maybe somebody might be able to use guarded speech um, that would allow somebody to, you know, you could, you, you know, the Nazi knocks on the door and you say, I would never allow any dogs in my house. And the Nazi's like, oh, you're a good German, good. And he moves on. Like, now you didn't lie because maybe. You'd, some of us might have dogs in our house. But some of us <laughs> would be like, yeah, yeah, I don't have any dogs in my house. I just allowed him to think that I meant no Jews. But this is just maybe some guarded speech, right? You know? Or you can think the police officer rolls you over, pulls you over, and he's like, were you speeding? And you're like, me? Speed? I would never want to speed. Want to? <laughs> I did. <laughs> But I just allow the conversation to move in a different direction. I, I didn't actually lie. I just allowed it to kind of go beyond. You can think also there's what we call circumlocution, where um, you or I kind of gave an example of that. The other one that I wanted to go over is the equivocation or what's called mental reservation, um, where you uh, don't speak the fullness of what you mean. And now in this, is a, it's a, this as they say, it's... Um, where did I say it? Somewhere. It's a controversial method of whether or not this would be moral or immoral. Some would say, like, mm, certainly what we say, strict mental reservation would always be, a, basically, it's called a lie. You know, that you can think, for example, when your dad says, did you break the lamp? Uh, you know, and, and, you, and you say, I didn't break the lamp. Because in your mind, you were saying, it was the baseball that broke the lamp. But we all know that it was you who threw the baseball. But you, nobody could know that that's what you meant when you said, I didn't break the lamp. Everybody's assuming that when you say, I didn't break the lamp, that you're saying, you didn't break the lamp. So you could say, like, strictly speaking, I didn't try to lie. I was telling you, I didn't do it. It was the baseball. But So this is why it's like, no, that's always a lie. But a broad mental reservation is when, when most of us could understand it if we really thought about it. The person you're speaking to could understand if they really thought about it, but you're allowing them to become deceived. You can think, for example, there's a classic story of St. Athanasius who was in, uh, in um, B -B Alexandria, and he was being chased by the authorities because they decided that he was uh, a bad Christian. And so he gets in a boat, and they're rowing away from the city. And then, you know, and he realizes, like, we're not going to outpace the guys in the boat behind us who are coming to get us. So he tells his boatman, turn around and let's go back. And so he turns around, and they're going back. And then they come across the boat who's coming to get him. And they're like, have you seen the man Alexander, uh, Athanasius? And he says, he's right in front of you. And they say, okay. And then they keep rowing in front. They're like, they obviously thought he meant, like, just beyond, like, keep going a little bit further, and he's going to be there. Like, now... If they had thought about it, they could have said, like, he's right in front of you means, like, oh, you're him. This would typically be considered that broad mental reservation, which most would agree that is allowed. That's not lying. Even though you allowed the person to be deceived, you would be able to do this if 
there's sufficient reason. You can't just do it whenever you feel like it. But if there's sufficient reason for the person who doesn't deserve to know that truth, because they're going to like kill you or whatever, and it's not your fault. Now, if you deserve to get killed, then you should just take your punishment, right? Go to jail, turn yourself into the police, take your t okay. Because ultimately, we need to have respect for the truth. We ought to have respect for the truth because truth is rooted in God. And so if we disrespect the truth, then we're disrespecting God who is, because we said truth is a person. And so we need to re-examine our hearts. And if we're going to be like every normal American who just lies habitually, then we need to re-examine our hearts and say, I need to be less like an American and more like a Christian. I need to re-examine my relationship with truth now that I've come to recognize that truth is, is Jesus. And I want to be in love with the truth because I'm in love with Jesus. And I want to let nothing separate me from the truth because I want to let nothing separate me from my God and my Lord. Obviously, the, there would be uh, the idea like, what about secrets? You know, well, obviously, the big one would be like the secret of the confessional wherein the priest is never uh, going to betray a penitent by word or any other uh, manner for any other re for any reason you can think. But it also, uh, like different people might take have a promise to keep a secret. But you want to think my promise to keep a secret is probably going to be best served by saying nothing. I'm not obliged to open my mouth, but when I choose to open my mouth, I am obliged not to lie. You don't have to say anything, but you do have to not lie. And so I think, for example, of a priest who uh, was arrested for a, a crime that was committed on his computer, and they asked him, uh, you know, obviously in court, like, you know, did you commit that crime? And he said, I can't talk about it. And so he went to jail because they found him guilty. Like, he doesn't want to talk about it. Okay, well, that means he's guilty. Years later, a student came and said, I had used father's computer to, use, to do that crime, and I'd gone to confession to father, and that's probably why he said I could not talk about it. And they found that they had, you know, put, but that that's what a priest is supposed to do. Right? They were just very clear to us in the seminary. Like, you don't lie, but you also don't break that secret. You go to jail. And if they ask you to, you die. Because as we said, better to be a martyr, to bear witness to the truth, than to lie. Was, uh, yes, sir. Was he, released after all he, he was released after the uh, student um, took responsibility for the crime. Yeah. How many years was he released? I don't remember the exact time, but it was over a year. Yeah, yeah. There's a, another story of a saint who he died for it. Um, and he was, it's, once, you're, once he was executed, it's too late to bring him back, even if the truth does come out. But we don't worry about him because he died and he went to heaven. He's with God in heaven. Yeah. Now we can, you know, blame the guy who, you know, lied about it, you know, but we don't, we don't, uh, we don't. You know, there's another movie, if you like movies about this, Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, has a movie called I Confess. It's a black and white from uh, Canada, it's, but it's a great movie that kind of explores that idea of a priest who refuses to break the secret of the confessional. I Confess, uh, Alfred Hitchcock. So a fun movie if you want to have a movie night. So, um, but in general, you know, like, you know, there would be times when we would not want to break secrets, but the, again, as we said, we would just keep our mouth shut. Don't, don't lie to keep a secret. So... And then there's the last little part on the catechism about truth is the relationship of truth and beauty and art. And so just to kind of ponder that art is meant to convey something. And so art should also speak truth. And this is what's wrong with so much of modern art, right? That it's not speaking truth, it's speaking chaos and disorder. Uh, but if art is meant to speak to the viewer, you know, and this is where I'm going to say something that's just very controversial in today's society, but it's just what the church says, is that beauty is not in the eye of the beholder. You don't decide for yourself what's beautiful. Beauty is. It's an objective reality. Like, there are things that are beautiful. 
and it's our job to allow the beauty to enter into our minds and for us to recognize, yes, this is beautiful, because this is true, that the truth is beautiful. Our Catholic faith is beautiful, and we want to recognize all art is either participating in that beauty or it's lying in what it's conveying. So there's more that could be said, obviously, on art. There's more that could be said on truth, but I'll take a pause here and ask questions, comments, debate, discussions, arguments, qualms, conundrums, concerns, queries, confusion. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, we can certainly kind of have the idea of conventions and whatnot. You know, and we can certainly say, for example, I'm not lying when uh, I say that, um, you know, the sun rose or the sunset was at, you know, what, about 6.15 tonight. And you can say, like, well, Father, in your mind, were you really thinking that the sun decided to move below the horizon? Or did, were you actually thinking that the earth kind of rotated on its axis in relationship to the sun, such that really it's the horizon rose at 6.50. Like, you didn't speak the truth. It's like, well, the convention is to speak about sunrise, sunset, right? So, when, and when I speak and say sunset was at 6.15, I don't think any of you think that I'm trying to convey to you that the, earth, the sun's rotating around the earth. I think most of you think that I, I'm trying to convey to you that, okay, it means that the earth rotated on its axis in respect to the sun. And so, too, we can say, like, uh, there are things that maybe we're, it, we, the convention that everybody understands, but the problem is, do children really understand that? You know? And so, is the child capable of understanding that this is a convention? Or does the child actually believe that there's a fat man in a red suit who somehow squeezes down the chimney? And so I think we need to really kind of examine that. Certainly, I'm not calling it out. You know, I know it's meant not to hurt anybody, obviously, when we talked about that. You know, it's obvious, you know, there, so if it's a sin, it's obviously going to be not a horrible sin. You're not doing it to hurt anyone. But is it the best thing for us to do? No, is that, the, is, that, is that the best way for us to honor truthfulness, to, to tell a story to children about Santa Claus? On the other hand, to balance this out, there are things that are best conveyed in stories instead of in uh, maybe cold-hearted facts that don't convey the things. You can think, for example, Chesterton famously this is a paraphrase. He has a whole little paragraph, but he, he basically says, fairy tales are true. Not because they tell us that dragons exist, but because the fairy tale tells us that dragons can be defeated, that good can win over evil. And so the manner of the story, you know, we tell the fairy tale of, you know, Jack and the Beanstalk, maybe because we're not trying to tell the boy that you know, look out for magic beans that might actually grow, a, you know, a kajillion mile tall bean stalk, but because we're trying to tell the boy that there are bad things in this world and good can conquer over bad things. And so, you know, it's a difficult answer, question to answer, but I do think we want to ask ourselves those two things of like, what is the truth that we're trying to convey and what is the manner in which that truth can be best conveyed to the child? And so if we're going to utilize the convention of a Santa Claus, then we need to somehow make sure that as the child comes to understand what truth are we conveying and is this, and ask ourselves as a society, is this the best way to convey that truth to these children at the, in age that is appropriate to the child? So if that's confusing maybe I, I don't mean for it to not be confusing if that's fair other questions that are easier for me to answer <laughs> yes mm-hmm Right. They say out of respect because 
Right, and so I'd say I'd suggest though that it would, yeah, that, that respecting, uh, you know, this false religion. Like, well, the religion itself doesn't deserve any respect uh, because it's false. But the persons who hold that religion, I might respect. And so it might be out of respect for my mother, my father, my Mormon elders who were decent human pe beings in as much as they were trying to teach me how to be good, true, and kind and all the virtue. Like I might say, in order to respect persons, because persons deserve respect, I might not break those. And, 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 that's, and that's where we have to kind of balance. And that's where I'm not going to say that because there are people in like Freemasonry who promise to keep it secret and they've come out of Freemasonry and shared the truth. There's people who have been in Mormonism who have shared that. I'm not going to say that they're wrong to break that secret because they, they, they see that they do have this duty to uh, help others to avoid the error. And to avoid the error, they need to share the truth in its entirety at the cost of breaking those secrets, which they feel themselves no longer bound to by not being in this false religion. Mm -hmm. So um, that's not, yeah, so I've had other people in other, if you belong to secret societies who sometimes are like, what do I do with this? And it's like, well, you could, to honor your pe fellow people, you could keep the secret, but you're not honoring the society anymore. You're not honoring the false religion anymore, but you could still choose to honor the people because they're worthy of being honored. But you might, for the sake of people, say, no, I need to speak the truth and I cannot remain silent. And you know, this is where it's going to come down to, you know, you're going to have to kind of weigh the uh, circumstances of your life. Who are you talking to? You know, let's just say, uh, you, you think, for example, maybe I don't yell it from the housetops, but I do when I have my friend who's saying, I'm thinking about becoming a Mormon. You say, let me share with you, you need this information. And I divulge that secret. You know, you know, on the same idea of keeping secrets, you know, um, you know, a classic one that a lot of kids deal with, but I think it could be adults as well, is like when your friend says, you know, I'm suicidal, don't tell anyone. And it's like, well, I told, I need to keep that as a secret, right? Because they told me in confidence. It's like, no, you need to break that secret. Now, we could say maybe you were foolish to promise to keep it a secret, but maybe you promise to keep it a secret before you even knew what you were promising, right? So often people are like, I'm going to tell you a secret. Don't tell anyone. Promise me. And you're like, oh, okay. Maybe you shouldn't make that eat promise. Maybe you need to say, it depends on what you tell me. Like, you know, if you tell me, you know, but on the other hand, you can say, if I say that, they're not going to tell me at all, right? Okay. You know, we have to, you know, there, there's, there's a, a balance here and a messiness of life, but we can think, I don't want to lie is a good fundamental plank. I don't have to always say everything I'm thinking of is, is a truth, but when I do say something. So I don't have to break the secret, but if I, but there would be times when I, I can't not speak it or else I'm now standing on the wrong side of being honest and truthful. Absolutely. And which is why I think it's better to, suit, to place that thou shalt not lie in the context of honesty, truthfulness, instead of simply in the context of lying. And so having that broader vision of what best speaks to truth, what best speaks to honesty, and being a person of integrity is a, helps us to know what to do with our prudential judgments. So, And then we're going to break here. I think that was my last slide, right? Yeah, I had a pretty picture just to make it happy. Um, that, we're going to break here, and we're going to go upstairs on a field trip to our church. Uh, we, we can come back down here if you want to leave things here, or you can just leave from the church. Either one will be fine. So I don't mind you coming back down here if you don't.